passage of scripture was just read for, for us a few minutes ago, taken 1 Corinthians 13, verses 5 through 11, as telling us that we're to be fellow workers of God. You know, in real life, there's times that we might use the phrase, more modern term, co-workers, people that we work with, perhaps in our communities, our school systems, certainly our place of employment. Sometimes you see people every single day. In some cases, people spend more time with their co-workers than what they do their family on a regular basis. We know the importance that we need to be team players, we need to get along, we need to be able to communicate. All of those skills are vitally important in, in having a, a successful relationship at our place of employment. Some people can just do that normally and naturally. Other individuals, it takes a great deal of, of effort on their part. As Christians, fellow Christians, we are, we are to be fellow laborers, co-workers in God's kingdom, God's vineyard, and the church. Sometimes Christians don't always act like fellow laborers, do they? In some cases, brothers and sisters in Christ act and behave like enemies. Or they're not getting along. And they quarrel. And they bicker. And people get upset. And we see that when that happens, Christ loses and Satan wins. Things would continue to deteriorate, go from bad to worse. In some cases, churches begin to dwindle away and fail. And sadly and tragically, sometimes have to close the door forever. We need to be able to work together. Perhaps you recall back in the early 70s, uh, uh, a mishap happened out in space with Apollo 13. And uh, there, was, there was an explosion on board. And the Apollo 13 was losing power, losing oxygen. They were on their way to the moon, and they had to complete the trip, trip and circle to come back to, to Earth. And at first, everyone just thought, well, the crew's lost. But you know what? People got together, and they started working. And all the engineers and scientists in, in Houston, they began to work, and they began to talk. And the astronauts on the ship, they began to work. So we had, we had perhaps hundreds and thousands of people working night and day to solve this problem. That's what engineers do, don't they? They solve problems. And they were eventually able to come up with a plan to return those three astronauts back safely to Earth. Rather than calling it a failure, they called it a successful failure, where at least we got the astronauts back. When we work together, we can accomplish a lot. And I think that's one thing that Satan really fears. He does not want us working together. He wants us to be distracted by the world. He wants us to be involved in our own problems and our own issues. He wants us to quarrel and bicker about almost any issue. Sometimes congregations, I can remember sitting in business meetings where we'd spend two hours talking about what kind of a vacuum cleaner we're going to buy. That's ridiculous. And it's ridiculous when we talk about it here, but it actually happened. What color we're going to paint the walls? And on and on it goes. And, and there's nothing wrong with having a discussion. And yeah, there's different approaches and how much money we're going to spend. But I've seen instances and examples of where brethren get mad and they're incensed about it. Almost to the point that they're ready to start striking out and trying to hit their fellow brother in Christ. We are fellow laborers. And there is so much that we can do and accomplish when we work together in a congregation, we can build up the church rather than tear down the church and the congregation. I wanted to just touch upon a few of the highlights from this passage of scripture, which is the text of our lesson this morning. Paul talks about that even as the Lord has given opportunity to each one of us, we all have opportunity. Sometimes opportunities just fly over our head and we know we're not even aware of them. And sometimes an opportunity comes and we say, well, you know, I'm kind of busy and I just don't have the time to deal with that. And so we just allow it to pass us by. We have all kind, we spoke in our adult Bible study class about procrastination and excuse making. Sometimes we engage in a conversation with someone about God and Christ and we, we just kind of go quiet and silent and say, well, nothing I say is going to do any good. They're not going to listen to me. I don't want to be a failure. I can't stand talking to someone again and they just walk away and they're not interested. It makes me feel bad. There's a lot of opportunities 
that we get. Now, sometimes these opportunities come our way, and maybe we need a little bit of help. There's nothing that, in the Bible that tells us we can't take someone along with us to have a Bible study or talk to someone who's, who's got some spiritual issues and problems. We can see that in some cases, Jesus sent out the apostles two by two. So it doesn't hurt if we, if we work with one another, but we need to take advantage of these opportunities. God gives us opportunities. Another thing we need to remember is that God causes the growth. God works with us. Sometimes we say, well, how are we going to get this congregation to work, and how can we get it off its back, and it's, it's just almost dead, and, and what are we going to do? We need to remember there's nothing that we can do just all by ourselves. God is willing to work with us as fellow laborers. When the children of Israel first entered into the promised land, and the first city was a formidable city, the city of Jericho, had these huge walls. And the Hebrews probably thought, well, how are we ever going to be able to assault this city? And how are we going to get through those big walls? And, you know, if you get up too close, they start shooting arrows and, and spears at you. And they, they dump hot oil down your back. There's just no way we could take this city. Well, there was no way they could do it by themselves. God was with them. They worked together. God told them what they needed to do. And, yes, his instructions, they didn't make a lot of sense. Go out there and march around the city once for seven days. It just made, it wasn't logical. It wasn't remotely logical. But they had a good leader, Joshua. He led them, told them what to do, instructed them, and they did it. And with God's help, the walls of Jericho fell down, and they were able to assault the city and take it. They worked together. We need to understand, as it says in the, one of the final statements of this passage, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. That's the point that Paul is trying to tell us here. We're not by ourselves. We have God's help. God is the one who gives the growth. <clears throat> There's times I've seen congregations who are blessed and they grow. You know, I've been in, in, in faithful conservative congregations up to as much as 500 people. And one of the problems is, is sometimes that pride and arrogance can settle in and we think, oh, look what we've accomplished. Oh, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have Brother So-and-So as a preacher. He's been here for 25 years, and well, people are just flocking in to hear him. Oh, we, we've got a fantastic eldership. We, on and on, we got this big building that we built. We spent $5 million on this building. It's just a wonderful building. We need to be, there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves, but we need to remember that we're working with God. And also, we don't do these things to glorify ourselves, to glorify a preacher or an eldership or a congregation or their building. We do it to glorify our God in heaven, praise him and worship him. We must never, ever forget that. And if we start getting the big head, big head and get arrogant about it and, and start, you know, patting ourselves on the back, God may abandon us or remove the candlestick, that candle lamp that that uh, the Lord spoke about in Revelation 2 and 3 with the seven churches of Asia. I want you to ask yourself this question this morning. Are you God's fellow laborer? Are you working with God? You know, sometimes we're not working with God. We're working against God. We're fighting against him. We, we're looking at uh, the spirit, eight spiritual building blocks or graces located in 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 5 through 11. And, and, and we work together. Some people, they don't achieve that. They don't grow. They don't mature. They don't develop. They're working against God. Remember Jesus once said, you're either for me or you are against me. Jesus once said, no one can serve God and mammon at the same time. Mammon literally means money, but you could look at worldliness. You could also substitute Satan or the devil. You can't worship both. Sometimes we think we can. We think, well, uh, I'm going to sit on the fence. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to also the world and Satan, and I'll just stay here on the fence, and I'll be safe. And you've heard me say time and time again that the fence doesn't belong to God. It belongs to Satan. It's another ploy that he uses to try to convince us to be disobedient. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker, 
and the gospel to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, we're to all be God's fellow workers. But if we're going to be his fellow worker, we have to do it on his terms. So often we say, well, I want to work with God, but I want to do it my way. How I think. How I feel. That's the way I work with God. No, it has to be according to him. You know, it's kind of like maybe you get a job in construction. If you're building a house or you're building some commercial structure, and you go in there, you know, you're just starting off, and maybe you're just a laborer. That's it. There's, there's a union just for laborers. You got a boss, don't you? If you want to be a fellow worker, you're going to have to do what the foreman tells you to do or the superintendent tells you what to do. You just can't go out there and say, well, you know, I, I'm going to build another little addition over here. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do the plumbing the way I want to do it, or I'm going to do the electrical work. No, you don't. if you're going to be a fellow worker, you've got to follow the rules, instructions. You've got to set a blueprints that you have to follow as you all work. People have to be able to communicate. The plumbers, the electricians, the general contractors, concrete finishers, they've all got to work together. You know, you travel very far from this area, you just see buildings going up everywhere. When Cindy and I drive here from Greenfield, we, I don't know how many buildings and homes we see just sprouting up. And for that to happen, people have to work together. They have to work together. If they didn't work together, none of that would happen. Romans 16, verse 21, the first part of that. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. Paul got along with Timothy and Titus and others. He had a lot of co-workers that worked with him, and he worked with them. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23, as for Titus, he is my partner, my fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the churches of glory to Christ. Are you a laborer that seeks ways to labor? What kind of a worker are you? Are you one of those that gives your all? Or are you one of those that says, well, I wonder how little I can get by with. We're supposed to start at 8 o'clock in the morning. I wonder if I'll get by with it if I show up at 8.30. We're supposed to quit work at 4.30. I wonder if anybody will notice if I leave at 4. There are some people like that. If their foreman and superintendents allow them to get by with that, they'll do it. Hopefully that's not the kind of Christian we can about. Well, I, I want to get by with the men. You think if I just show up on Sunday morning, that's it, one hour, and, and the Lord's going to be happy with that, and I'll still just be able to sail right into heaven? Is that the way it's going to work? Some people think so. That's all, that's all it means to be a Christian is to give God an hour a week. Maybe I give God two hours a week, three hours a week. What do we do with the rest of our time? Could you support your family on working couple hours a week, maybe some people do, it'd be great. You may think, well, that'd be great and wonderful if I could, but we know that it's not realistic. In Titus 2 and verse 14, we can read, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Zealous! You know, there's been times I've, I've sat in business meetings and well, we've got some kind of a project, we need to do something. Uh, th does anybody want to volunteer to do this? You know how often I've just seen, all of a sudden everyone starts looking down. And <laughs> nobody looks up. Just, oh, please don't call on me. I don't, I don't want to do this. Sometimes you'll have a person who will volunteer. Th that's the way we need to be. I mean, if, it's, if we have the abilities, it's something that we can do. You know, our hands should shoot up and say, yes, I'm willing to do that, whatever I can. It may be inconvenient, it may not be pleasant, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a fellow worker with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. And went, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Matthew 9 and verse 7. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Do you still believe this verse? Some of my brethren say, Well, that, that's just not true anymore. Nobody, nobody's interested in the gospel. Nobody's interested in God. Nobody's interested in Christ. Nobody, nobody wants to be involved in a church or a congregation. People, they, they don't believe in the Bible. So we, we shouldn't even try. 
And granted, if you look at the statistics, they're not encouraging. But that does not mean that there are not people out there who need the gospel, who need God. There are people out there who are searching. And if our paths cross, we should try to reach out to them. Sometimes we like to profile people. We think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll seek out someone, but, but only if, if they meet my, my profile. You know, in other words, they're, they're individuals that they're, they got good jobs and they live in a nice home and they live in the best part of, of the community and, and they've got their act together and they don't have any problems. Okay, I'll study with them. Is that what Jesus did? Oh, I'm just going to work with the, the, the best Jews there are. What about Matthew? He was kind of a character. What did he, he was a tax collector. Everybody hated him. But Jesus reached out to him. The Pharisees, they gave him a lot of criticism for that. Zacchaeus? What about the, the, the woman, the, the adulterous lady who was thrown at his very feet? And We see he didn't, he didn't want to stone her like everyone else wanted to, did he? He didn't encourage her sin. He told her to go and sin no more. But we see that he just, Jesus didn't just spew out hatred. Jesus had often reached out to the people that needed help. He looked at them, okay, they're sick. They need a physician. Do healthy people usually run to the doctor all the time? No, it's usually the sick people. I got a problem. I need some help. Can't take care of this myself. I need a surgery. I need medication. Whatever. The harvest is plentiful and that is still true today. Still true. Well, are you one of those laborers that starts today or tomorrow? You know, some people say, well, I'll start tomorrow. That, that sounds good. It's kind of like when we're going to diet. Oh, I'm going to go on a diet. I need to lose weight. Maybe it's Friday. You say, well, I'll go on a diet Monday. You go out on the weekend. You go out to eat all the time and consume about 10,000 calories a day. Oh, I'm going to go on a diet Monday. Then Monday comes, well, I'll start my diet tomorrow. There are people like that. And we've probably all made that mistake at one time or another in our lives. We postpone things until tomorrow. I, I know I need to become a Christian. I know I need to obey the gospel, but I'm just not ready. Maybe next year. Maybe after I get my children raised and they're out in the world, then, then I'll commit to the Lord. So, so people put that off. We see it in Hebrews 3, verses 13 through 15. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, something else we see in Proverbs 27, 1. Do not boast about tomorrow. Sometimes we do that, don't we? We boast about tomorrow, especially when you're a young person. You think you'll live forever. Tomorrow, I ran across this interesting quotation, tomorrow is the excuse for the lazy and the refuge of the incompetent. Something we need to work on. Revelation 3, verses 1 through 2. Are you a person who finishes what you start? He talks about the church here in Sardis that started out well, but then had some problems. And he says, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of God. In Acts 15, verses 36 through 38, and we look at, uh, it says, And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord, seeing how they are. And Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with him also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Paul was a little upset with John Mark. They were in a trip. They were doing they were preaching, working together. And for whatever reason, he decided to go back home. We don't know why. Perhaps John Mark, you know, maybe his reasoning, we might have said, well, I can understand that. And we also realize that this is Paul's opinion. And in fact, Paul and Barnabas would have some sharp words over this later on. It was just how Paul felt about it. Paul thought, yeah, well, if you sign on, you're going to do something, you're going to finish it. How often do we say we're going to do something, and then we don't? Sometimes we think, well, you know, we have statute of limitations. I said that a year ago, so I, I don't have to do it today. 
we make a commitment, we say we're going to do something, we need to follow through with it. Are you a laborer that seeks excellence? We sometimes talk about our workmanship. Let's do the best we can. So a person says, well, I need you to do this report. It's important. Have it done in a couple of weeks. And sometimes people procrastinate about it, and then they'll wait, kind of like homework assignment, they wait till the, the very last minute, and then you know, they'll try to crash and get, get everything done. They hand in the report, full of typos, full of misrepresentation. If there's, there's calculations involved in numbers, sometimes the numbers are incorrect, not valid. It's not complete. It's just shoddy workmanship. Well, usually in the place of employment, a person isn't going to get along very well with that kind of approach. People are looking for, for excellence. Now, granted, no one's perfect. We all make mistakes, but we at least want to have that reputation. Well, you give that person a job, and they're going to do the very best they possibly can. That's the kind of person we want to be, not only in our secular lives, in our jobs, and in our families, but, but also in the church. We're going to do the very best we possibly can. We're going to seek excellence. I think that's what Paul did. Ecclesiastes 9, 10. Whatever your hand finds to do verily, do it with all your might, for there's no activity or planning and knowledge and wisdom and shio where you're going. Give everything you got. And we talked already about Revelation 3, 15 and 16, about neither being hot nor cold or, or lukewarm. Are you a laborer that preserves? perseveres. We need to persevere. We need to endure. That's not always easy to do. Life, life can really wear us down. There, we have problems and we have difficulties and we have challenges and we get discouraged and we get depressed. We often say life isn't fair and it, no, it isn't. In any stretch of the imagination, it's not always fair. We see some individuals who have more than their fair share of health difficulties and problems. I know people like that. Throughout all the years I preach, it's just one thing after another. No fault of their own. That doesn't seem fair. Why some people are the picture of health and they live to almost 100 years old and rarely ever have to go in and see the doctor, never take any medication. And then there's someone over here that's on all kinds of medication, had all kinds of surgeries, all kinds of problems and constant pain. Doesn't seem fair. The Bible addresses that. That's in another entire discussion itself. And it's hard to persevere, but that's where we have to try to learn to place our trust in our God. In Romans 2, verses 7 through 8, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness. We see in Hebrews 6 and verse 12 that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You ever gone to a school track meet or cross country? And you, you, you know, especially in cross country, you may have hundreds of people out there, depending on how large uh, schools you're dealing with. And they start off, and everyone's, you know, they're, they're doing pretty good. But then as people start wearing down, they start, they start getting tired. And it's at the finish line where you begin to see who still putting some effort in it and some they gave up a long time ago. We need to learn to persevere. It's not easy. Galatians 6 and 9, let us not lose heart in doing good for in due time we shall reap. If we do not grow weary. Do you use your abilities? You know, we have the parable of the of the one talent man who he had one talent, he had some abilities, but he didn't use it. He didn't use it. He tried to hide his talent. Ephesians 4, verse 11, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building of the body of Christ. I'm not saying that every man has to be either a preacher or an elder, but I know some individuals who are really good speakers, but they, they never want to preach. They never even want to teach a class. I've known individuals who have a lot of good abilities as far as maybe they could, they could be a, make a really good elder or a deacon. But they don't want the responsibility. And yes, I know that the Bible tells us that individuals like that need to desire 
that office. But my thought has always been, well, why don't you desire that? You have the abilities, you have the talent. If you're going to be a fellow worker with God, then why don't you use those talents and abilities to glorify your God in heaven? I think a lot of it has to do with our concept of retirement. People say, well, I've worked hard, and, and now it's time for the, the young fellows. It's, it's to turn things all over to them. And we can see that in the past couple of decades, individuals, they've been retiring earlier and earlier in their life. It seems to be going a little bit in the other direction now where people are working longer because of the economic circumstances have, have changed. And sadly, I think there's some older folks, both men and women, who think, okay, well, we're retired now. That also means we're retired from being a fellow laborer with God. Where do we read that in the Bible? You only have to be a fellow laborer until you retire. Until you hit 65. In some cases, we see that people at 65 are still extremely healthy. They may be extremely healthy if they're another 20, 30 years. Think of that. Almost a third of your lifetime where you are freed and released from responsibility of working for an employer. you got all this time in your hands, and so yet we sometimes just want to self-gratify ourselves. Nothing wrong with enjoying retirement, but we need to find time and room to serve our God. And also as we get older, we've, we've learned a few things along the way. We've got experiences. We've got wisdom. Hopefully our knowledge has, has grown through the years. We have so much that we can offer the congregations that, that we are a part of. We want to be fellow workers. We want God to wear us out in our service to him. In 1 Peter 4, verses 8 through 10, and above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, and each one has received a special gift employed in serving one another as good servants, the manifold grace of God. There's the idea of serving one another. We, that, that word kind of leaves a bad taste in our mouth, doesn't it? I, I, I don't want to be a server. Uh, I don't encourage my children. I want you to grow up and learn to serve. Do we say that? No, I want you to be a captain in industry. I want you to, to be a senator, president of the United States, a CEO of a large corporation. We just say, I want you to serve. We need to remember Jesus Christ served came to this earth to serve. He served his disciples, washed his disciples' feet. We can go on down the list of all the many different ways that he has served us. And yet we can go back to John chapter 1, read in that chapter that in the very beginning, the word was with God, the word being Jesus Christ. Jesus was involved in the creation of the world. He referred to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. We see that Jesus had the ability to forgive people's sins. We see that Jesus could walk on water. Jesus could reason with the most brilliant minds that the Jews had at the time, and he could make them look foolish, uneducated, by just using simple everyday thoughts and ideas. Jesus was the master teacher. He's our savior. All of those things, and yet he was a servant. He was a servant. We want to follow in his footsteps so that we can serve other people. Where we get into the trouble is when we, we can't be co-workers is when we get jealous and when we get envious and we say, well, that person, he, he seems to have a little more control and, and people listen to him, so I don't like him very more so I, anymore, so I'm going to oppose him in everything that he does. These power, petty power struggles that sometimes can happen in congregations that are unfortunate. We're not going to be fellow workers. We're going to be working against each other. And when we work against each other, we're working against our God in heaven. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers... I think I've already read that. Let's move on to the next one. 2 Timothy 2.2 And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We need teachers, we need preachers, don't we? Desperately. Sometimes we have the attitude, well, if we want to have preachers in the church, we've got to send them off to some college. Nothing wrong with college. I encourage my sons to, 
to attend college. But we need to be careful about thinking that, well, a preacher, he, he needs college. That, that can certainly help him. But in, in many cases, churches have that responsibility. I'm not talking about establishing preacher schools, but working with a young man. Perhaps he can, he can work with, with an eldership and work with, with, with an older preacher, spend a little bit of time with him. We see there's a lot of congregations that do that now. A young man will come in, work a couple of years, learn what he needs to know. And I think that addresses what Paul is talking about here in trusting to faithful men who will be able to teach others. We need to encourage these young men because we need them desperately. You know how often I've heard in the last few years congregations looking for preachers and they say, there's not as many out there as there used to be. It's getting harder. A lot of young men say, well, I don't want that lifestyle anymore. It's just, it's just too hard on my family. And, and, and financially sometimes it can be a, a real struggle and a challenge. And yes, we can get very critical and say, well, they're just preaching for money. Everyone else, they have wives, they have children. A lot of times young men will say, well, we'll, we'll maybe appointment preach, and that's fine. I've known a lot of men who do a tremendous amount of work in doing appointment preaching and just filling in where they're needed. And there, there are congregations that are desperate for individuals who can do that. We need to learn where we can, we can get involved. But the congregation, I think, needs to t congregations need to take this seriously. Teaching and encouraging young men to become teachers and preachers. And perhaps as they age and get older in life, also serve and work as elders. We need to remember that the future of the church depends on this. Do we want there to be congregations for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren to worship? I think all of us would say, well, yes. To do that, we have to be fellow workers with the Lord and God. So as we come back to this question, are you God's fellow workers? Are you just working for yourself? Are you just working for yourself, your family, or are you a fellow worker of, of God's? Is your labor for the Lord a labor of love? You ever heard the expression someone say, well, if you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. There's a lot of truth to that. If, if you love your job, you don't look at it as work. It is a labor of love. That's the way we should look at it with our families and our young children. I know sometimes when you bring that baby home from the hospital and that baby's crying all night and you're exhausted and you're tired, you say, well, I don't know about this being a labor of love. But it is. Once you get on the other side of it, you say, well, it was... The most important thing, one of the most important things I've done in my life, and I appreciate them so much. It is a labor of love that we invest in our children. That's the way we should look at it in being a fellow labor of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved children, excuse me, beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Sometimes in our jobs, we may feel like, well, I just don't know if I got much accomplished today. I don't know if I'm being appreciated. I, I just don't feel like I'm, I'm getting anywhere in my job. There are times that maybe we do have to change jobs. There's nothing wrong with that, changing jobs. Sometimes we need a different type of challenge. Perhaps opportunities come our way. As long as we work, that's all that's important. But we need to remember that whenever we serve our God and his fellow workers, we, it is not in vain. We have a vitally important job. We're talking about the souls of everyone around us. That's pretty important. Perhaps we have one in our audience this morning who's subject in some way to the invitation. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to come forward, repent of your sin, confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and then we can immerse you in the waters of baptism. Maybe you're a Christian, you've lost your way. We encourage you to come back. We can make prayer on your behalf. and You can be reunited with your Lord, once again being a fellow worker with him. Subject anyway, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.